Happy Memorial Day. My uh, mom used to say, you just remember, ain't nothing free. And uh, for all those that are serving and have served and, and those that we lost, I just want to say thank you because I wouldn't be able to stand up here and do what I'm fixing to do without somebody paying a price for it and somebody fighting for it. So happy Memorial Day. Uh, this week has, uh, has been a busy week, like Bobby said, and uh, before I go too far, I want to pray. I'm going to get silent for just a minute just to let y'all know, because I like to try to clear my heart and mind and let God say whatever he wants to say, so it might get a little awkward, but it'll be all right. God, thank you for this day. Thank you just for another opportunity to tell people how much you love them and uh, what you did for them, what you can do for them. Thank you for all those men and women who've gone before us and fought for us and, and give us the freedoms and privileges we get to enjoy. Help us to, to never take them for granted, dear Lord. Help us to never take you for granted. Dear Lord, I just pray that uh, in these next few minutes that you'll just clear our, mar- our minds and our hearts and open our hands and our ears and our eyes or whatever you, whatever you want to do. I pray that you'll get me out of the way and, and you'll just say whatever you want to say and that we'll just have the faith and trust to know that you will show up if we believe and, and uh, dear Lord, help us to believe and know who you are and uh, just help us to be open minded enough just to simply respond to whatever you're saying to us, God. I thank you for this time, and I ask it all in your name. I love you. Amen. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, like I said, it's, it's um, you know, been a busier than usual week, and how often do, uh, when you ask somebody how they're doing, they say, Man, I'm busy. Or you ask, you ask, you give ever had to somebody say, are you hard at it? It's almost like you, the expectation is to be busy. If you ain't busy, there's something wrong with you. You're lazy, right? That's, it's, and in America, we try to do as much as we can in a day. And we try to make things as instant and fast-paced as possible, right? So... Being busy is supposed to be a good thing, right? Well, I learned the more I get silent and the more I ask God what he wants to do, the more God reminds me that that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, we're going to look at a story today. That's, that's a pretty well-known story in the Gospels. And uh, it's a story that I've read many, many times. But like I said, uh, and trying to be obedient and, and getting silent and still before God, God showed me that, uh, that I am one of these two people we're going to talk about today. Uh, this story is in Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. It's about Mary and Martha. Uh, before I read it, I want to give you a little bit of, of context. Luke is the only Greek... Gentile writer of one of the Gospels. This is only this story is only Luke is the only one to record it. And I, when I first figured that out or read that through study, and I wondered, well, why is Luke the only one that says anything about this? Well, if Luke, you know, writes the Gospel of Luke and Acts, and it's really one big book, but the, we break it up into two books, I guess, to try to help you understand a little bit. But the very first verse in Luke chapter 1, he says, Most Honorable Theophilus. And that's who he's writing to. He's also writing to Gentiles. but uh, And Theophilus just means um, one who loves God, but it's also a title, most honorable. You know, you wouldn't say most honorable like, like you're saying uh, sir or lord or, you know, king or some, somebody with a title. So he's more than likely writing to some Roman person we could assume. And Luke was a physician or a doctor. 
Uh, he was a trained, learned man, so you know he, he was smart. Um, and one of the things I love about Luke is most of the time he has more details because it seems like maybe this Theophilus or somebody probably commissioned Luke to go and see what this Jesus fellow was all about. So it was almost like Luke was going around asking these people, interviewing these people. And I'm sure this story is only found in Luke because Luke goes up to Mary and Martha and probably asked them. And Mary and Martha tell them about this story, but one, because Martha gets corrected, and two, because Mary gets almost kind of praised for her obedience to God. But anyway, let's, let's read it. Luke 10, 38 through 42, verse 38 says, As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was worrying over the big dinner. She was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. After I read that beginning of this week, I said, Lord, I'm a Martha, and I didn't even realize it. How many of you like to be busy? How many of you like to do stuff? How many of you like to stay busy? You say, you know, I stay busy because it keeps me out of trouble. And I thought that for a long time, so I just surrounded myself. I got two full-time jobs. <clears throat> I realized that me making an excuse for that was just not having the faith for God to show up. And I make myself so busy that I don't have to rely on God because I don't even have time to think about it half the time. In verse 39, Martha, so Jesus came to a certain village. That certain village was Bethany, which was about two miles away from Jerusalem. Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem. And uh, I just told you that this story is only found in Luke. And that raised another question in my head. Well, why is it in the other Gospels? And some people could even use that and say, well, that just gives you a little bit of evidence that maybe their stories didn't match up, or maybe the Gospels ain't all true. When you think of the Gospels, think think, think of a wreck at an intersection, and there's one person on every corner. Every person's going to tell that story a little bit different because they're seeing it from a different angle. And you got to look at the Gospels. You can't read the Bible like a book. The Gospels are almost like journal entries. you got to imagine these people are walking around and asking, interviewing these people or seeing this stuff firsthand, and they might remember, just like if you were to keep a journal when God showed up and you wrote it down. And that's what this is. And, and when we get to the end of this, I'm going to show you that Mary and Martha show up in another Gospel. And even though Martha kind of gets condemned in a way here, she gets redemption in the end. And there's redemption for you and there's redemption for me. The only thing you got to do is just believe, right? So Mary, Jesus comes to a certain village in Bethany, which is just a little town just right outside of Jerusalem, on kind of near the Mount of Olives, um, Her sister Martha and Mary. Which Mary? There's like, I think there's four Marys in the gospel. It's hard to keep up with. Uh, Mary. I had to make me a little card. I'm telling you, there's so many Marys. Uh, So there's Mary, the sister of Martha, and the brother of Lazarus. And we all know Lazarus, the guy who Jesus raised from the dead. Then there's Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then there's Mary, the mother of James and John. And then there's Mary Magdalene, the demon-possessed woman whom Jesus healed, and the first person to see Jesus that Jesus had resurrected. So there's four Marys. But this Mary is just the sister of Martha. But she has some significance because she's got faith like, like I hope to have, if I'm being honest. 
So this is that Mary. So Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to him, being silent, being still, being present. Uh, I've told y'all almost every time I've got to preach this year about Thanksgiving, God called me to, to pray more because I realized that I, I'm not that good at praying. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm good at praying for other people's requests and for my own requests, but I'm not that good at just being in the Lord's presence. Even when you worship. You notice when you worship, you're worried about, you know, if I hold my hand up, are people going to judge me? If I sing a little loud or if I actually praise and worship and get in God's presence, are people going to think about what I'm doing? If you just get in God's presence, I promise you he'll take care of some stuff you never thought he could. And that's what this is about. That's what God's trying. This is a, to me, this is a parable just to Mary and Martha. I know it's not listed as a parable, but it is because Jesus tells Martha there's only one thing worth being concerned about, and Mary has discovered. Mary's figured out that if you'll just get in my presence, that it's me that can do all things. It's not. It's not all your activities. It's not all the things. And Martha, I don't want to paint a bad picture of Martha. Martha's not doing the wrong thing. It's, it's good to serve. It's great to serve. It's okay to serve. But if you haven't gotten in God's presence first and asked him what to do, that's what leads to your service. Not Works doesn't lead to faith. Works doesn't lead to more grace or mercy. Uh, some of you might even came to church or became a Christian because you thought, if I get saved, then I'm going to get more blessings, right? If I serve, if I pay my tithes, I'm going to get more blessings. God's going to show me more favor, and my life is going to be better, right? No, right? <laughs> so what Mary is displaying is that you just got to be in God's presence. Mary is content. What is content? Content is a state of peaceful happiness. What's the Bible say? Jesus gives you joy and peace unabounding. Joy and peace is something that no amount of money, possessions, material things can, can give you. There's a difference in joy and happiness. Joy is everlasting. Joy doesn't go away. Happiness comes and goes, right? I can be happy in five minutes. And How many of you like to watch football? Any kind of sport. You can be happy, and, and in five minutes, they kick a field goal, and you not be happy, right? Joy is everlasting. Joy is something only God can give you. And that peacefulness comes from being content and being okay and saying, I don't have it all figured out. But I'm going to get at God's feet and give it all over to him. Now, Martha was worried. So you could say Mary was content, right? Martha was kind of discontent because she was worried about, you know, Jesus is coming to my house. I got to make this certain kind of food and we got to put out the, the, the good plates and the, and the table settings and light the candles and have all these things. And, I, and Martha, and so then when Jesus comes, Martha's so overwhelmed by doing all the things that she misses the whole point of even having the meal, and that was because Jesus was there. And Martha's, I can imagine, you know, imagine if, if your brother or sister's just sitting on the floor listening to Jesus and you're running around doing everything, what do you start to do? What happens when you're discontent? You start to compare yourself, right? You start to compare things. Comparison comes from discontentment. Discontentment comes, what comes with discontentment is being frustrated, being annoyed, being irritated, being angry, being fed up, being resentful. She sees Mary over there not doing anything and she starts comparing. And then she passes aggressively, says, Lord, don't it seem unfair that Mary ain't doing nothing and I'm doing everything? What you going to do about it? I'm not telling you what to do, but I, I am telling you what to do. <clears throat> Comparison. I want to, 
How, did you? I, I was listening to somebody this week, uh, some kind of podcast. I can't remember. Um, but he was saying that. How many of you have Facebook and Instagram? If you got it, guess what? If you got it and you look at it daily, you're 90% more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression because of comparison. Because you only get the highlights of everybody's life. Guess what my generation created? The selfie. That's terrible. Our claim to fame is taking a picture of yourself. Did you, did you know more people die taking selfies than they do getting bit by sharks or, and or a list of other things? That's a category now, death by self. You are so worried about yourself that you're willing to die for it. You imagine standing on the Grand Canyon or standing on the bridge and you're trying to get a picture and there you go. Because you're so worried about yourself, right? You're saying, everybody, look at what I'm doing. I want everybody to see so they can compare and say, man, I bet Nick's having a good time. And you don't know it, but over here to the side, you got both kids crying, your wife hollering at you. But they only see this one, see you in this one light, right? Amen. I... I've never took a selfie. I'm proud to say that. I, let, I have never posted a selfie of myself on social media. I've took a picture of my wife, of myself, sent my wife doing something silly, trying to cheer her up. But uh, if you want me to show you how to take one, me. It's where you hold your phone up and you put it down. That's how you take one. You don't need to take selfies of yourself. I'm serious. Comparison makes you discontent. We live in a world that's, you know, all about ourselves. And we've taken one day out of the year to remember that people bled and died for us to be able to take selfies. And we've even made that day a celebration or an excuse to go to the beach and drink beer and, and have a good time, right? Nothing wrong with any of that stuff, but what's your heart behind it? Is it yourself? So when you're discontent, when you're thinking about what everybody else is doing, it's going to lead to all these things. It's going to lead to the comparison, the frustration, the irritation. And so the busier I get, what happens? Well, why ain't everybody else working hard as I am? Why am I having to do all these things? Why ain't nobody looking after me? I'm looking after everybody else. Has your mama ever told you, ain't nobody going to take care of you but you? That's a lie. God's going to take care of you. You stop worrying about yourself and let God worry about you. The only thing you got to do is get in his presence. Paul in Philippians 4. How many of you know what Philippians 4.13 says? It's one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. Most athletes quote it or write it on their face or their cleats. or I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? You, you take that verse out of context. I'm going to add Christ to my life and he's going to give me strength when I want it. No. If you read, everybody knows Philippians 4 and 13, but not many people know Philippians 11 and 12. Paul, talking about contentment. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. How? How? I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Not adding Christ to, not and Christ, but through Christ. Christ through you. He's inside of you. But you got to let him, right? And if you're busy and you got your bucket so full, you can't even 
Christ can't even get in. He's just floating on the top. How many of you like pickles? I like pickles. How do you get a pickle? It's got to soak, right? It's got to be fully immersed. And it's got to be there for a while. A pickle don't turn, a cucumber don't turn into a pickle in one day. You can't expect to come in here one day a week and be fully immersed in Jesus and know what he's saying and wants you to do. It's got to be every day, all day. But you got to be willing first. You got to die to yourself second. And then you just got to trust him. You got to be in his presence. But to do that, you got to empty yourself. So if you're busy and doing stuff all the time and not even have, I want to be so busy, I don't even have to think about what I'm doing. I'm just doing. And I do that so I don't get in trouble or so I don't have time to think about the things I struggle with or temptations. I'm just going to be so busy, I just... That's my natural habit. Natural habit is to be busy. Because you think, well, I'm doing stuff for other people. That ain't selfish. But what... What uh, I don't know if I can find it now or remember it. Hold on. Your service, you think you are, you're helping people. I'm doing stuff for people all the time. Don't let your service become self-serving. You got to be in his presence first. See, see, Martha thought Mary's style of serving was, was inferior to hers. She didn't realize that in her desire to serve, she was actually neglecting Jesus. Are you so busy doing things for Jesus that you're not spending any time with him? You can be doing good things and it still would be a bad thing. I hate that strong word, how the church throughout history has labeled certain things bad things and certain things good things. And you think that if you do these things, that it makes you more righteous or holier when it's all the same because your heart behind it. You could be serving. You could be teaching Sunday school every single week, going to the fish fry, cooking the fish, doing all the things, and your heart behind it be, I want people to see me and see how good I am and see how humble I am and see how faithful I am. That's self-serving. and pe- Nobody knows that but you and God. I'm talking to myself. God helped me to realize that When you get in his presence, you're going to have to deal with some things. And they ain't going to be comfortable. And it ain't going to be too fun. But I promise you, if you just take that first step in obedience and trusting that God has a better way, and you get that first victory, he'll give you another step, and another step, and another step. And then you'll realize, I don't have all these things on me anymore. I don't have to carry all this stuff. I don't have to do all these things. And that's what true freedom is. God wants your attention, not your activity. When you give God your attention, that might lead to some activity, but not the other way around. Don't get it out of order. I made Martha look pretty bad, didn't I? There's redemption for Martha. There's hope for Martha's. I'm a Martha. I know there's some other monsters out there. There's hope for us, okay? In John, chapter 11 and 12, Mary and Martha come up again. I like to think that this first encounter when Mary and Martha go, when Jesus goes to Mary and Martha's house that first time in Luke, I like to think that's the first time. And And then he comes back because it says... In John chapter 11, 
when Jesus is, is dealing with Lazarus who's sick and he dies and, and Jesus lets him sit for a couple of days and Mary and Martha's like, why'd you do that? He's dead now and he, he smells worse and you can't go in there. He comes back to their house. And remember, Bethany's only about two miles from Jerusalem and this is in the final week of his life. And right after that, and, and John records it this way. Remember, the Gospels are, are just guys recording what they're seeing and hearing. So John records it this way when talking about Mary. A man named Lazarus was sick, and he lived in Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who poured expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with, the, with her hair. This is that Mary. That Mary that spent a year's salary to anoint Jesus six days, the day before he goes into Jerusalem, the day before the triumphal entry, six days before he dies. Mary knew who Jesus was. But like I said, there's hope for Martha. After, that anointing happens after Lazarus is raised from the dead. But in John chapter 11, let me find it. Jesus talking to Martha. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, when everyone rises on the resurrection day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and life. And those who believe in me, even though they die like everyone else, will live again. They are given eternal life for believing in me and will never perish. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord. She believed then. And God was gentle enough with her when she was too busy serving. If you notice in Luke 10, 41, but the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, how, many, how often do we like to point the finger? You're doing it wrong. Jesus loves her enough and has compassion and is gentle enough with her to say, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. You don't need to be. You just need to be in my presence. And comes back later and does it again. God over and over and over. This whole book right here is just God over and over and over telling you how much he loves you. Jesus loved her enough to come back and explain it to her again. And then she finally understood who Jesus was. So there's hope for us, Martha. But just remember, you got to be still. Psalms 46, 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Some translations say, Be silent and know that I am God. Are you? Can you? Will you? That's the whole point of this message i have to ask myself that every day lord help me die to myself show me where i need to die and lord help me when i want to be busy when i want to forget about you and just keep going and keep doing and even though it looks good it don't feel good because i know why i'm doing it I heard another funny thing uh, when I was studying this week. You know, we get to comparing and, and looking at what other people have and, and where other people are at in their lives. And, well, Mary looks so peaceful. I don't know how she does it. I, she just floats around like a butterfly. I don't know how she just, she just knows. I wish I had that. Don't compare your faith to others. Don't compare your walk. Don't compare anything give it all to God there was a guy that said he he would he uh, tells his kids because what what do we deserve we deserve hell right we deserve death 
The penalty of sin is death. We sin every day. Jesus paid that price. But there's, there was a guy that said he started, when his children complain, he just says, better than hell. So I don't want these Cheerios this morning. Well, it's better than hell. Well, I don't want to go to school today. Well, it's better than hell. <laughs> it's true. It's funny, but it's true. Last thing I want to tell you. We're going to do something here in a few minutes that I try to do every day. Do I do it every day? No. But I need you to remind me. Call me Martha if you have to. I challenge you. I'm asking you to pray for me. I asked you to pray for me last time I preached, I believe. But uh, we're going to get in God's presence. And I just want you to ask, what do you want me to do? Where am I at? And see what he says. All right? After we get done praying, I'm going to say amen and the band's going to come up. And we're going to give you an opportunity to just respond whatever God's doing. You can respond in your seat. You can come pray with me. You can come pray with Bobby. You can do whatever you want to. But until God moves, I'm going to be up here. And I don't know when that's going to be. But I'm stepping out in faith just like I'm asking you to step out in faith, okay? God, quiet our hearts and minds right here, right now. Too often do we preach and, and tell people how to do it, and, and not too often do we practice it or, or put it to the test, dear Lord. And, and dear Lord, we're just trying to come before you and sit at your feet right now and just clear our hearts and minds and, and just empty us, dear Lord, and just help us to see whatever you're trying to say. Dear Lord, help me to have the faith and obedience to just to just be still and be present. And that's what we're we're going to do here, right here, right now, God. And I just pray that uh, you'll just bless this time and show up. God, forgive me for spending too much time worried over things and and not about you. And, Lord, help us to do this every day, just to be in your presence and, and to let you speak. God, I pray for anybody that, that just asked you, for them just to simply respond in, in whatever way you asked them to. God, as the band comes up, I pray that, that you'll just be with us, dear Lord, in this time of worship, dear Lord, and that we'll just be still and in your presence and truly just worship, God. Not be worried about anything around us, but just to be at your feet, dear Lord. Forgive me, dear Lord, for any pride rising up or, or not being humble or, or, or being selfish in the way I serve or, or any of it, dear Lord. I pray that you'll just break all those things off. I pray for Anybody, dear Lord, in this building, dear Lord, that, uh, that is willing that you'll just continue to break those things off and, and that we can just continue to come together, dear Lord, and, and be unified, dear Lord, and, and show this community, dear Lord, what you look like and help us not to close our minds off to what that looks like and where it happens. God, just empty us. And fill us with your Holy Spirit. And I just pray, dear Lord, that right now in this time of worship, that people would just respond to you. I love you and thank you.